Hi everybody and welcome. Thanks for joining in. I'm Will Green, a research associate at the Perry Institute for Marine Science. And today I'm going to be talking to you all a bit about the work I've been doing with PIMS on coral reef photogrammetry, photomosaicing, and 3D modeling. Let's dive in. At first glance, this probably looks just like a photograph of a section of remarkably healthy coral reef. And in a sense, it is. It is a reef. Uh, it's a section of an inshore Acropora, Elkhorn, and Staghorn coral dominated reef near Abaco in the Bahamas. But this isn't a snapshot from a camera. It's actually a screenshot of a computer visualization of millions of tiny points in three-dimensional space derived from a set of around 3,000 underwater photos using a technology called photogrammetry. The basis for this technology is actually older than photography itself, but it's only in the last several years with advances in computer processing and digital photography that it's become possible to use it on a large enough scale to create underwater models of coral reefs, just like this one. We at the Perry Institute are using photogrammetry to help us monitor, restore, and protect coral reefs in the Bahamas. So I think photogrammetry and modeling is wicked cool, and I could definitely bore you all to death with it and talk about it for hours. So I'm gonna to try to keep this talk pretty streamlined, and I hope I'll have enough cool visuals to keep you awake and engaged. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes, and then we're gonna have some time for questions. First, I'll introduce you to what this is all about and give a brief explanation of the technology and how it works. Then I'm gonna talk more specifically about the photogrammetry work that PIMS is doing, and I'm gonna show you all some demos and visualizations, which will be the fun part, and go into some of the data that we're just starting to pull from this. And I'll finish with a plug for how this can be really a, a useful tool for reef conservation down the road and where we're looking to take this in the future. I'll start with a bit of my background. Uh, I was born and raised on Mount Desert Island on the coast of Maine and fell in love with nature and science and photography with Acadia National Park right in my backyard. Uh, like Craig said, I graduated from Middlebury College in Vermont in 2019 with a degree in conservation biology. So that's the lens that I really look through all of this at. Um, I became interested in GIS and cartography and 3D modeling and spent the last year helping teach GIS at Middlebury. Um, I learned to scuba dive when I was 10. Uh, our local dive club is called the League of Underwater Superheroes, hence the pose in this photo of young Will. Uh, but I really got interested in reef science after taking a course at Middlebury that Dr. Dahlgren helped teach. Um, I started talk to, talking with him about photogrammetry and reef modeling, and we've been working together ever since. Uh, and this summer, I I'm super grateful to have officially joined the PIMS team, and here I work at, uh, on photogrammetry and GIS. So as we all know, uh, coral reefs are in dire straits, and the fact that you signed up for this webinar probably means that you're aware of this, so I'm probably preaching to the choir. Uh, but reefs are really the canary in the coal mine for climate change. Warming oceans have led to increases in diseases, coral bleaching events, and stronger storms, and coupled with pollution and overfishing, reef ecosystems might not be around that much longer in the way that we know them, since they contain 25% of the ocean's biodiversity, only covering 1% of the ocean floor, and they feed more than half a billion people. That's a pretty scary prospect to lose those. So what do we do? Uh, we need to research and understand how reefs work uh, so we can be more effective in protecting them. Uh, we need to monitor their decline, advocate and educate leaders to create policies that help keep them alive, and in the interim, restore reefs by growing and outplanting corals to help keep the ecosystem functioning. I'm gonna talk about the middle two needs. How can we monitor reefs at a large scale and create products that help inspire people to care? So for monitoring, previous methods include uh, point count surveys or transect surveys that we've collected for many years and a lot of other organizations collect too. Uh, we use the AGRA Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef, uh, Reef Assessment Protocols for doing that. That's what it, on the left, that photo is of several divers uh, from Middlebury 
collect, conducting one of these surveys. And in addition to that point count, like spreadsheet data, we can photograph individual colonies to get a visual snapshot of what they look like. These are great, but point counts require a lot of people and a long time, and underwater photos are limited in terms of how much they can capture at once. So how can we quickly collect lots of data over a relatively large area? In terrestrial environments, it's not that hard. Uh, we have satellite and aerial imagery. That's how we usually accomplish this task. Satellite imagery is awesome. Uh, in the field of remote sensing is primarily dedicated to interpreting images like this one to get useful data about what's on the Earth's surface. But it's only in two dimensions. It assumes that the world is flat without elevation. Uh, and for applications where you need to know three-dimensional information, we have technology like LIDAR for doing something like studying the canopy structure of forests in the three-dimensional structure of a landscape. This is what a LIDAR point cloud looks like on land. And it has potential to be a useful technology underwater too, but the cost of an underwater LIDAR system is super high and requires very specialized equipment. And it's just not practical for many organizations like ours that need a straightforward, simple, and fast way to collect data. Satellite and aerial imagery have a lot of use for reefs, but they're limited by resolution, like a satellite image in the upper left, because reef systems operate on a pretty small scale. Um, and even with drone photos, where you can get a much higher resolution, like the other three photos here, you're limited by water clarity and by surface distortions and reflections and even waves, like in the bottom left photo. So we've kind of ruled out the top four options here. They're impractical for us in a lot of ways. So let's explore the last option, underwater-based imagery. Taking photos underwater isn't super hard, especially with advance advances in uh, digital photography. But our goal is to be able to monitor and measure things underwater. So we hit an immediate roadblock, because when you take a photo, you're collecting information from just one perspective, like the photo on the left. And perspective distortion makes objects further away from you appear smaller. We all know that, that's just how our eyes work too. So you can't really take measurements from a single photograph very effectively. And even when you take a photo straight down, objects at the side of the frame will appear smaller than they actually are. So what we need is to find a way to create a synthetic image that is in effect an orthographic perspective, as if the camera was infinitely far away so that every point within it looks like it was viewed from straight down. Having that, we'd be able to take measurements. The solution to do that is photogrammetry, which is most easily described as the science of taking measurements from photographs. And I think the best way that I've heard anyone uh, talk about it is it's like the reverse of photography. Photography is where you take a 3D scene and you project it into a two-dimensional image. But photogrammetry is taking a two-dimensional photograph, actually many of them, and converting them back into a three-dimensional scene. Once you've created this virtual three-dimensional scene where you know the orientation of each image, you can use that positional information to warp or orthorectify the original image or images. And if you take many photographs from different perspectives, you can stitch them all together into a high-resolution map that you can measure distance from at high resolutions. The concept of photogrammetry dates back to actually Leonardo da Vinci, believe it or not, uh, like in the 1400s, who played a key role in figuring out how perspective distortion works. Um, making maps and measurements from photographs was actually an early use of photography itself in the 1800s when it was invented. But it wasn't until the invention of planes that the technology really took off. Uh, in this photo, you can see that before planes, we several people actually tried to strap aerial cameras onto pigeons to take photographs from the air to stitch together. Geographers using the new technology of planes used it in the 1900s to create contour maps like the USGS topo maps that many of us are really familiar with. How does it work though? I'm gonna see if I can explain it because it's a little complicated. The basic principle behind it is just triangulation. 
if you take photos of the same thing from different perspectives and can find matching points within them, points that are further away from the cameras will be at a sharper angle to the two viewpoints than closer points, like I am showing in this little chalkboard sketch that I drew. And if you know how far apart the cameras are, you can calculate how far away the objects are from the cameras and from each other with the differences in angles. That's the concept behind photogrammetry. Orthomosaicing or orthorectification is a slightly different concept. And the way that that works is once you know camera positions and have figured that out through photogrammetry, you can figure out which direction within each photo is straight down and knowing camera parameters like focal length, you can actually remove the perspective distortion that's introduced, which is called orthorectification, removing that, so that the distances between objects in it are actually correct and measurable. And by stitching many of these orthophotos together, we can create a synthetic image of a larger area that's still orthographically correct. And we, can, we used to do that by hand like in this photo where Air Force engineers are piecing together an aerial orthomosaic by hand. But fortunately, it's not quite so hard anymore and you don't have to, we don't have to do it all by ourselves. Uh, with advances in computer vision technology and processing power, we can now do most of it automatically and on a massive scale using photogrammetry with, to, with thousands of photos at a time, recreate the 3D structure of a scene, and I'm going to show you what that looks like pretty soon, and then mosaic the original images together into a two-dimensional map, an orthomosaic. And there are a lot of software solutions for achieving this. Um, I, I showed a few of their icons on the bottom. Some of them may look familiar if you're in the field of photogrammetry. Uh, at PIMS, we're using the one on the bottom right, which is called Agisoft Metashape. Uh, the program is amazingly powerful. Um, and it lets us generate a suite of different products. Uh, these orthomosaics that I've just been talking about a little bit, digital surface models that represent the elevation of each point, or in our case, actual three-dimensional mesh models of the scene. And each of these products has a different use, enabling a host of different ways to analyze, quantify, and visualize whatever you're taking photos of. All right, that's all I've got for the background. I hope some of that made sense. I know that I'm talking a little bit fast, uh, trying to get through all of this uh, not too slowly and to keep you somewhat interested. Um, so now let's move on to how we at PIMS are using this technology. And I'll talk a little bit about how it works underwater and what we can actually do with it. And I'm gonna show some, some cool visualizations that we've created. So the first step is site selection. And what at PIMS, what we have done is for the sites that we typically collect point count data within the Agri database, Agri sites, um, we have chosen a plot within that, within that site or on that reef, typically about 10 by 10 meters. Um, and then before we get into taking any photographs, we collect georeference information on that site. So what that means is we're, we place scale bars, like in the bottom right, that are all exactly 50 centimeters long with color breaks at every five or 10 centimeters, uh, and place a bunch of those throughout the scene, usually around five or six. And then on the surface, we collect GPS points at the four corners of the plot, or, or, and or really, at points throughout the scene. And each of those scale bars that we place on the bottom before we take any photos, we use a dive watch to collect, collect depth information for each point and record that just on a clipboard. And then we take the photographs. The way that that works is you swim over the reef in somewhat of a lawnmower pattern. That's the best way I've heard it described. Um, and typically, we'll do two passes. We'll go in one direction, like in the image on the bottom left here. Um, and those little flags show where we've taken theoretical georeference points. And once we've done the, the first pass, going in one direction, we take photos back over it in the other direction. And we take a photo 
every second uh, it, with the camera on intervalometer mode so that it's taking the photos itself. And in order to do this for a site that's around 10 by 10 or sometimes 10 by 20, sometimes even larger, which I'll talk about more later, this can take somewhere around one to 3,000 photographs, depending on conditions like depth and how co structurally complex the section of reef is that we're looking at. When we're taking the photos, we try to stay within about two meters of the substrate in order to limit the effects of backscatter and just water absorption of light and particles that may be present in the water. And the way that we thus far have figured out where we are taking these photos is just navigation by memory and looking at the gear that we've placed on the bottom. So as you swim over a section of reef, you remember a coral that you've gone over and then you turn around, swim back over that same section and try to go like about a meter on the other side of whatever coral you just swam over so that you can keep moving and photograph the whole area. There's a ton of, you, you can, for photogrammetry, you can use pretty much any digital camera that works underwater. Um, many researchers use GoPros for photogrammetry because they're quite inexpensive and very easy to use. Uh, at PIMS, we've opted for a high resolution system. We use a Nikon D850, um, which is 45 megapixels, allowing for really amazing resolution. And we typically use somewhere between a 20 millimeter and a 35 millimeter lens, which allows for a good balance of resolution, like how far we can zoom in, and coverage, how much area each photograph covers. And I'm gonna, at the end of this talk, if you wanna know more about why we choose what we choose uh, in terms of camera equipment, please just ask me um, if you wanna know more about that and I'll chat about that in the question section. But like I said, we rely on the camera's intervalometer to take a photo every second. And we only use natural lighting because the program has a hard time stitching photos together if you're using your own light source and shadows are changing. Uh, we try to use a shutter speed faster than 1 3 20th of a second to prevent motion blur. And to maximize the depth of field, basically how much is in focus within each photo, we try to use the smallest aperture possible given how much light we have available. Uh, so if it's pretty dark out or if it, we are at a deep reef, we have to use a larger aperture, which, makes a sm which means a smaller depth of field, less is in focus, but lets in more light. And we typically use, uh, set the ISO, the sensitivity of the film uh, to auto because the camera is, super, super advanced, and it is an, it's able to produce relatively grain-free photographs, even at high ISOs or high sensitivities of the sensor. Once I've taken the photos, uh, we bring it into software to correct the color and remove uh, distortion. So the program that we use for that typically is Adobe Photoshop or Lightroom, and um, what you, the, way that, the way that I typically do this is you can see in the top photo, areas that are supposed to be white or neutral colored are actually this blue tint. So you calibrate the white balance in from one of the photos based on that so that, that then that color becomes white or neutral. Uh, and then apply that adjustment to all of the photographs. And I've also experimented a little bit with removing uh, camera distortion that's just introduced by the lens itself. Um, in order to create more accurate models, but the, the scientific nature of that distortion correction process is something that I'm still working on figuring out. So once I've color corrected the photos, I bring it into Metashape. The first step is to allow the program to align cameras. And what that means is finding tie points between all of them. And once it's found matching points between all of the photos, it's able to recreate the structure of the scene in 3D and figure out where the camera positions were taken. Uh, and that's called a sparse point cloud when you have those tie points. Once you have that, you can densify the point cloud, which basically means taking each photo and creating a depth map for it, figuring out how far each pixel is away from the sensor, and then placing that point into the scene. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Once you have a dense point cloud, 
Then we move into our two-dimensional and three-dimensional workflows uh, that I talked a little bit about earlier and we'll talk a bunch more about as we go along. Um, I'm going to start by showing some examples of what the 3D workflow looks like in order to create a textured mesh model. And then I'm going to show a little bit about uh, just an example of a, a digital elevation or digital surface model and an orthomosaic generated from that. So here's what a sparse point cloud looks like. Um, this is actually of that exact same section of reef that I showed on the very first slide. Uh, and what you can see is all of these, it's about a million or two million, I can't remember exactly for this particular scene, tie points that the program was able to find between photos and the position of each photo is shown by the blue squares. So you can see how that overlap pattern, that lawnmower pattern that I was talking about works once you create the sparse point cloud. Now, I don't know if you can see the A, B, C, or D in here, but in the top left, uh, figure A, I am showing a sparse point cloud of a reef off of Abaco in the Bahamas. And B is the dense point cloud version of that. So that's been, uh, depth maps have been created for every image and additional points have been added. C is what I was referring to in the previous uh, two slides ago, a tin mesh. And what that is, is it's a triangular interpolated network, or tri sorry, triangular irregular network. And it's basically creating a polygon mesh that does as well as it can to recreate the structure of the reef. And then once you have that structure, you can overlay the imagery that you originally took to, and it sort of like places pixels onto that mesh to create a textured mesh, which is part D in this uh, illustration, bottom right. Um, and that textured mesh is an amazing uh, visualization tool that we can share with people and it actually really shows you what a coral reef would look like without water. Um, here's an animation, and I, I hope that some of you at least have fast enough internet that this animation will work. Um, several of the things that I'm going to show in the next little bit are going to be animations. Um, so I hope that this plays for you, but what it is, is a visualization going from sparse point cloud to dense point cloud to triangulated mesh, to a textured mesh, all on the same reef and in the same video. Um, you'll notice that the dense point cloud and the textured mesh both look pretty much the same. Um, the main difference is, I'm gonna show you here, um, the dense point cloud is going to have a lot more holes in it for areas that it wasn't able to find tie points or depth information for each photograph in. And so when I play the animation, you see that there's all of these holes in the model. The blue squares again show the camera positions. You can get a real sense from this one of just how big that huge coral colony of Orbicella fabulata is in the bottom. And you'll also notice that many of these corals are bleached. This photography was taken right after Hurricane Dorian, where many of the deep water reefs that we surveyed uh, actually had experienced a significant amount of bleaching from the hurricane. And that's something that we can talk about in the question section also, if you want to learn more. So here's the textured mesh model now, and you'll notice that it has far fewer holes. Um, it looks like it's having a hard time with the animation on here. That is unfortunate. Sorry about that. Um, point being is you're able to actually take volumetric measurements when you have a continuous mesh like this. And that's something that you couldn't do with the point cloud. So that's what I have for the 3D visualizations and what that could look like. I'll show you plenty more later. Um, what the 2D products look like is this. This is an orthomosaic, like I was talking about earlier. Um, it's about 1,500 photos stitched together and orthorectified so that you can measure distances from it. And it has scale bars set throughout the model um, so we know how large everything is. The digital elevation model that I was talking about, this is what that looks like. And what this is, the color represents 
the depth at each point that I measured with a dive watch and then input into the program to sort of reference the model um, and show how deep each point is. The thing to note in here, check out the Elkhorn coral in the top left and bottom left and just how much structural complexity they add to a reef, which is a great indicator of habitat quality. That's why healthy coral, part of why healthy coral is so important for the ecosystem. So we've got two dimensional and three dimensional products. Let's talk about the pros and cons a little bit. With two dimensional, the orthomosaic and DEM, uh, it's, it's great for a lot of reasons. First of all, it allows for simple planar measurement, right? like X, Y measurement. You can figure out how long and how wide anything in the scene is pretty accurately. It also results in just an image, which you can share very easily, just as a JPEG or whatever. Um, you can send that in an email or upload it to an FTP site or something like that, and that, that allows many people to look at it and analyze it. Two-dimensional is also great if you're making site maps for reference, you can actually you know, I, I could print out an orthomosaic and bring it to a site so that we can uh, nav use it for, for navigational purposes or uh, for comparisons, for time series comparisons, which is another great thing. It allows for simple time series comparisons. These two dimensional images are also much more streamlined for integrating into a GIS system or a database. Um, you can display it in a program like ArcGIS or QGIS. Uh, and these DEMs or DSMs can also be input into uh, a GIS program to be analyzed for something like rugosity, how structurally complex is the surface. But the main problem is that even with a digital elevation model, it's still in two dimensions and coral reefs just aren't flat. They're super complicated and some of them have many overhanging areas and uh, a great deal of complexity that can't be captured in two dimensions. So with three dimensions, that it somewhat solves that problem. It much more accurately represents what reefs actually look like. You can see how much depth there is for each like unit of x, y, uh, and how, how three-dimensionally complex these are. You can take volumetric measurements from these 3D models if you created uh, a mesh model. And it also has amazing implications for visualization, um, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. And if you create these at high enough resolution, you can actually use them for virtual reef surveys done in virtual reality or augmented reality software. Uh, and basically collect the same type of point count data that you would collect in an agri survey underwater virtually on a model. Now the cons of these 3D models is that they're difficult to share and require specialized software to view uh, because the files are massive and there isn't a super well established and universal file format to share these in, such as there is for two dimensional images like JPEGs or TIFFs or PNGs or something like that. It's also because of the storage space issue, um, you, we often have to make the three dimensional model have a lower resolution. Uh, and you definitely can't share super high resolution uh, three-dimensional models that have you know, millions and millions and millions of little triangles. It ha you have to keep it pretty small in order to share. So where have we been so far with this technology at PIMS? So far, we've collected photomosaic and uh, photogrammetry images at several sites. Um, we started with other uh, partners and partnerships in 2013, taking images uh, in Exuma Keys uh, Preserve National Park. Um, oops, I'm gonna go back, sorry. Uh, so we have imagery from this area in 2013, and again in 2017 for time series comparison. And we're gonna try to go back there in 2021. We have images from around Nassau, um, and then images from earlier this year actually off the south end of Eleuthera. And the biggest set of photo mosaics that we have is immediately following Hurricane Dorian, we surveyed around 30 sites around Grand Bahama and the Abaco Islands. And we also have a great deal of photo, photo mosaics of restoration sites near Castaway Key 
off the southern end of Abaco and have time series information on that data as well. Okay, now let's look at some fun 3D visualizations, a bunch more of them. Um, what I'm going to do here is go through, a, go through sets of models and talk about different applications of them. So to start, let's talk about small scale models just of individual colonies, which I think are an amazing tool for education and raising awareness. So I've been talking this whole time about taking thousands of photos of large areas of coral reef, right? Well, you can actually do this same process for single colonies. So in this instance, I took 50 photos of a colony of pillar coral, Dendrogyra cylindris, um, and recreated a three-dimensional model of it, just this one colony. So I'm gonna play that animation for you. You'll see the images that are flying in around it. Those are the original camera positions that I took photos from, all stitched together into a, a textured 3D mesh model. Oops, playing again. Okay, here's another one of a single colony of critically endangered Elkhorn coral. You can see just how amazing this visualization is. You can't, you can't get this type of dimensionality just from a photograph. You can't tell how, what these, what these uh, organisms actually look like. And that's the beauty of doing these small scale models. The larger reef scale models are also a great tool for education and awareness. Um, you can create models of entire reefs. This one from Eleuthera taken this January is a gigantic section of reef that's probably 40 by 30 meters. And by taking photos of the whole thing, you can generate a model that gives you a sense of the whole reef itself. And that can help. For instance, this is near the island school in Cape Eleuthera. And visualizations like this can help students gain an understanding of what the reef will look like before they ever get to visit it. Or in pandemics like we're having now, you can take a peek at these 3D models and get a sense for coral reefs without even getting, even having to go there or jump in the water. Here's another fun one that I played with the other day. This is the same coral reef that I was showing that was bleached after Hurricane Dorian. Um, and check this out. So this is underwater, real video that I took of Craig setting up a photo mosaic plot with a giant colony of OFAV, transitioning into a 3D model and zooming around it. And then switching back to a real video. Now you can see the amazing benefit is obvious. You remove the water and the clarity and ability to see individual things within this reef is greatly enhanced over just video that you could take underwater. If you would like to check out more of these models, um, I've uploaded a few relatively low resolution ones to my Sketchfab account. Uh, and if we have time at the end of this presentation, I'll, uh, I can, I'll follow that link and we can check out some of those visualizations. So now into research and monitoring. How can we use these tools to advance the research that we're doing here at PIMS? Uh, one way that we can do that is through time series photogrammetry. So we'll take the same set of photos from a site at multiple time points and then align the two three-dimensional models. And then we're able to actually compare how reefs changed over a large scale and then down to just the smallest resolution which is pretty amazing. So I'm gonna show some animations and images of time series comparisons that I've put together here. So this is a restoration site. You can actually see all of those little yellow tags. Those are Acropora colonies that we have outplanted. We've grown in a nursery and outplanted on the reef. Um, this is October, 2018. And then watch what happens in the video. As we transition, to a year later, October 2019, after Hurricane Dorian, you can see the damage that this reef sustained, which was relatively minor compared to many other reefs. But you can see these two colonies right here and right here, 
of corals. Those were not out plants, those were pre-existing. You can see that they just get wiped right off the reef by the force of the hurricane. Oops. So here's another comparison. This is just a, a photo comparison. Here's that, this is actually that same reef, uh, one from June 2019, and then again in October 2019. And I'm gonna toggle back and forth between these a few times. You can see the difference. So right here is a colony that stayed intact, right? It actually grew a little bit. You can see the extension on the arms of this uh, Aquapora cervicornis colony. But other ones didn't fare so well, right? Here's a colony right here, gone or scattered at least. The other thing to note is how much, this is all microdictyon algae, all of this green. You can see how much of that got stripped right off the reef by the wave action. It's pretty amazing to be able to get that kind of resolution. And this is just a zoomed way in on a much larger model. We can also do these comparisons in 2D instead of 3D. Um, so here is, this This is actually that same reef that we were looking at originally. It's called Sandy Key Reef off of Abaco. And this image on the left was taken in April of 2019. The image on the right was taken in October. Fortunately, this reef didn't sustain much damage from Hurricane Dorian. Here's a zoom in of that and showing uh, how the reef changed in that time period. I'm gonna to toggle back and forth a couple of times. Watch the growth ends on these palmata uh, elkhorn coral colonies. Oops, there's before, there's after. Before, after. They actually grew almost like four inches in the intervening six months. There was some small damage from the hurricane though. Check out this arm right here. After, it's now gone. There it is, <laughs> lying on the ground. And these are all just fine scale changes that we're able to detect with this technology across reefs and at a much larger scale uh, than even I'm showing right here. You know, you can do this over, you know, this, this plot that I'm actually looking at here was about 20 by 30 meters. Other than this time series uh, comparison, there's a lot of data that we can get just from a single image of a, of a of a reef that we wouldn't have been able to get with just point count data. Um, we can quantify the area, the planar area of each col colony of coral. So here um, we've been working on this reef. Each of these colonies of Aquapora palmata again, um, we've measured their planar length and width and surface area and can compare that and fate track each of these colonies and see how they fare uh, for analysis later on. We can also classify images to gain information from it. This is a, an Orbicella dominated reef off the southwest end of Grand Bahama. Uh, and this was also taken right after Hurricane Dorian. Uh, you can see all the amazing colors of Orbicella in this. It's really beautiful. What I have done here is used a classification program to uh, detect live coral versus dead coral. So here the green represents live coral, the uh, red is the not live coral basically. And once you've done a classification like this, I can very easily quantify how much of the reef is actually live coral. This section, for example, is 16% live coral which is not too bad for the Bahamas in this day and age. Another use for this is just simple visualization and map making, cartography, and cataloging reefs. Here is a site map of a mermaid reef off of Marsh Harbor in Abaco. This is pre-hurricane. Um, and you can see immediately that it's an amazing tool for getting a sense of what the reef looks like and where things are in it. And all of these little white squares that you can see are actually colonies, tagged colonies of the coral here that we have genetic, we've collected genetic samples from. And so having this map is an amazing complement to having that genetic data. We can tell 
where on the reef each sample came from. You can also use it to visualize larger sites like this one. This is the same reef that I was showing earlier. Um, it's just a simple, easy way to gain a much better understanding of a large area underwater. And that's something that you can't really do even when you're swimming on a reef because water uh, visibility is so limited. Even in the Bahamas where water, uh, where the visibility often can be almost 100 feet sometimes. And on a slightly more somber note, um, the reality is that we, is that uh, vibrant, healthy reefs as we know them right now are going to be less and less common in the future. And many of the coral species that I've shown you in these photographs and models are endangered or critically endangered. So having a robust snapshot of what they were actually like at a given point in time and how they grow and what uh, ecosystems they form is a pretty amazing thing to have. And one day, I hope that it's not, but having these models could be uh, kind of an analog to how ornithologists have audio recordings of bird species from species that are now extinct. It's a relic of a, of a time in the past. Here's another animation of that Orbicella reef off of Grand Bahama. So I'm gonna wrap this up now. Oops. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges associated with this technology. I've, uh, I've kind of glossed over most of it so far, but the georeferencing and accuracy assessment of these models is actually quite hard. Um, georeferencing is only as good as your GPS, and most GPSs that you can you know, swim in the water with, you, you can only use them on the surface, for one, uh, and their accuracy is quite low, only like two meters. And when you're working with a reef that's only 10 or 20 meters, uh, that discrepancy can actually be a significant problem. Um, the other thing to think about is how internally consistent these models are and how well we're able to tell like, whether the three-dimensional structure that we're seeing in our models is representative of real life. And the way that we've tried to do that is by placing scale bars throughout the model. You can use several of them or about half of them to scale the model accurately and then see how well the model is able to predict the length of the other scale bars. Underwater, you're reliant on having a very complete survey. If you don't take a photo of a spot, that becomes a hole in your model and you don't have that data to work with in the future. You're also limited by water quality. Um, if it's really murky, sometimes the program has a very hard time stitching the photos together. And the computer itself is a problem because we processing thousands of photos at once is really difficult and requires a lot of processing power. And it also requires an immense amounts of storage space. Uh, each model can be up to 200 gigabytes of data or more. So to wrap things up, moving forward, we have sort of five things that I've thought of that we need to do with this technology. First of all, we need to refine it and improve our efficiency, accuracy, and consistency uh, so that we can take, we can take photos and have, it, like, have a consistent protocol that allows us to create models that are easily comparable to each other. Um, we have a lot of work to do in terms of analyzing the data that we already have. We have somewhere in the realm of 80 reefs surveyed at this point, and there's so much data that can be extracted from those. But the benefits of creating these models is that we have them to work to collect data from forever um, moving forward. And as technology improves, we can uh, like reanalyze the photos and recreate models with higher resolution um, and sort of allow, it allows us to keep moving forward with this technology into the future and as we figure out better ways to do it. We also need to share this information and these models to advocate for good policy for coral reefs and to inspire people to care about them. Um, we need to go back and collect more data, revisit the study sites that we've already photographed and pick new ones to generate baseline data for. And then also I'm interested in expanding the scope of collection at each site so that we can photograph larger areas more quickly um, and figure out how to create maps of entire reefs rather than just a small section. And the last one is 
I would love to figure out how to crowdsource this and collaborate with our partners and with dive shops and find ways to make collecting this data and photographing reefs more accessible. You know, I, it'd be amazing to teach other people how to do the photography portion of this so that we can have uh, many different people collecting imagery and put it all into one database so that we can monitor much more effectively than having just a few people fly around um, and photograph just, just once or however often we can get down there. That is all I have for you right now. Um, I hope that that made sense and wasn't too quick. Um, thank you for listening. If you want to hear more about the work that Perry Institute's doing, I encourage you to follow us on social media um, at Perry Institute for Marine Science on Facebook and Instagram or on Twitter at Perry Institute or to check out our website. Um, and again, you can also check out those Sketchfab models uh, that I showed earlier and feel free to email me with any questions. I look forward to hopefully chatting with some of you in the future.